Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you I do not know, my name is Mike. It's an honor to welcome you here to week four, I guess, of our identity series. We have one more week in this, and uh, we'll be wrapping this one up. But it has been a fun journey learning who God thinks us to be, not who we think we are, but who God thinks we are. So I'm going to let you get ahead a little bit. I want you to take your Bibles, if you got them today, and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to camp out. Uh, you should have gotten a worship guide on the way in. It'll have an area for you to take notes on there. If you've got your phone today and you want to go to the app store, go to North Star Church, Georgia. Download the North Star app. If you got the app, open it up. Go to the message notes, and everything we talk about today will be right there. You can thumb it in, save it, email it to yourself. It'll, it's, it's a great way to do it. Um, so I remember I was one of those people growing up that I was a goal setter early. I remember my pastor growing up and my dad both encouraged me to set goals. Who do you want to be? You know, what do you want to accomplish? And what do you want to do? And I remember you would look out at people in a career path that you were in and you would go one day, I want to be like them. I, I, I see this in them and I would like to see that in me. I think this is my path. So back during those days, I probably thought if I wasn't playing ball, which that didn't turn out real well, but I thought maybe I'd get into coaching. And there were some coaches I really, really wanted to emulate and I really liked. Uh, I remember Bill Curry was at Georgia Tech back when I was growing up. And I remember he was just that, that consummate gentleman coach. And, and I remember going, if I ever got any coaching, I hope I'm like Coach Curry. But then, in the, then I made the decision in college that I thought ministry would be a route that I would go. And there were a couple guys. And one of them, the reason I thought about this, one of them I was with yesterday. I was in Peachtree City. And the, the gentleman that pastors this great church in Peachtree City that I was speaking to their men he was one of those guys for me. He, he was my youth pastor for a year, and then he went and planted a church, and it was just the way he carried himself, and I was like, I want to be like him. There are attributes of his life I want to be in my life. How many of y'all had somebody when you were growing up, there was somebody you wanted to be like? Raise your hand if you had somebody like that. It may have been a family member, it may have been a mentor. Well, I know that still goes on today, but there's another way we like or like people. You know how we do it now? We steal their identity. All right. And so instead of just being like them, we just go, well, I will be them. Do you know that in 2018, 16.7 million people had their identity stolen? 16.7 million had their identity stolen. See, we grew up wanting to be like somebody. Now there's a whole career path of, well, don't want to be like them. Just be them. Here's how you do it, all right? And so there's probably college classes. And that 16.7 million people represented $16.8 billion was stolen in identity theft. It's not crazy, isn't it? And so we have LifeLock, and we have all these things now. Did you ever dream you would have to lock your identity? I remember when I was in college, our... Student ID was our social security number. Everywhere you went, you're like, oh, my ID is blah, 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 blah. That's probably where it all started, started at Liberty. But anyway, so it, it's, it was the craziest thing. You didn't even think about it. Now you have LifeLock. We have our credit locked. And we have all those things. Why? Because we don't want anybody to steal identity. But there's another identity theft that's going on. In fact, this identity theft has been going on since man was created you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, there was an enemy who stole the identity of God's creation. Adam and Eve had their identity stolen, sent into the world, and everything's been different. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Philippians chapter 4. Would you stand with me if you got that open this morning? You can stand if you don't have it open. You can read along on the screen. Paul the writer of basically the majority of the New Testament, Paul is writing from a prison cell to this new group of believers, and they're being bombarded. I mean, they're being hit from all sides. They're new to the faith. They are trying to learn what it means. I mean, this whole thing of following Christ isn't hundreds of years old now. It's in its infancy. They're new at it, and there's identity theft going on. There's there's people robbing them of God's best. See, here's the crazy part. God has a best for you. 
God has who he wants you to be, and that's being taken from us. And he, he appeals to that. In Philippians chapter 4, we'll start reading in verse number 6. Paul begins to tell us how to battle it, and he goes right to us. He said, don't, what's the next word? How many of you guys worry? Raise your hand. All right. How many of y'all worried about raising your hand? All right, you worry, all right? And so you're like, I don't know if I should. I don't. All right, you worry. We all worry. They must have worried back then. Don't worry. I love what he says next. About what? What's the next word? That's a pretty broad word, isn't it? Test tomorrow. Crisis we're walking through. Junk that we're facing. Don't worry about anything. Instead, what's the next word? So he gives us an option. We can worry or we can what? Well, Mike, I can't pray that much. Well, we can worry that much. And worries are just prayers we say to ourselves, trying to answer them. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all he's done. You want to begin to win the battle of your mind? You want to begin to win the battle Learn to worry about nothing, pray about everything. Then, when you do that, you'll experience God's what? You know why we feel like there's always something missing in our lives? Because we're always looking for peace. Well, if I get this status, if I get this job, if I live in this neighborhood, if I drive this car, if I have this friend, if I have this many likes, if I have this many... um, friends on Facebook, if I, have, if I have all these things, that'll give me peace. None of it gives you peace. He tells us how to get peace. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Thank you for what is done. Then, then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can ever get here. You can even understand it. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. And I feel like I wasn't there in the jail cell. We don't have eyewitness footage of Paul writing this letter. But in my reading of it, in my understanding of it, I see Paul pausing. And he stops. Because he knows what he is about to write next, inspired through the Holy Spirit to put down on paper because he knew you would need it and I would need it in 2019. He says this, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Your minds are going to go a million places. Fix your mind on these things. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Thank God for what he's done. But one final thing. Man, get your mind in the right place every day then the peace of God will be with you. Father, today, may you rule our lives with the peace. God, we walked in maybe in anything but peace. God, may we walk out with peace. God, speak to us, teach us, show us today what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. You guys can be seated. So what we're about to talk about today, you would go, oh, this would be great. How many of you have a child 18 or under? Raise your hand if you have a child 18 or under. Okay, the majority of your room. So on an average weekend here at North Star, there are around 650 to 800 kids here every week under 18. It's a lot of kids. So you got kids at age. You will hear this today and go, Wow, this is going to be great to tell my teenager or my grandchild or a friend of mine who has kids. This will be great for them. I'd love to give them these notes. Here's what I would tell you today. The battle we're going to talk about today is great for a 20-something or a teenager. It's great to hear all this. Let me tell you something. The battle for our mind never goes away. 
If you're in here and you're 50 years old like me, right? You turn 50 and you're like, I'm not 50. Thank God I'm not that old. If you have a minivan, you're on the way. All right, and so it's coming. It's coming. Va- minivan's first step. There is a battle for your mind and there is no age limit on the battle. You want to read the Bible? Read the Bible and here's what it'll tell you. Sometimes God's greatest tests didn't come early in great leaders' lives. They come late. They came late in great people's lives. So today, what we're going to talk about is as real if you're 40 as if you're 19. Pen, pencil, something to write with this morning. I think, I think this will hit right where we all live. Number one, there is a constant battle for my mind. There is a constant battle for my mind. It began in the garden when when sin entered the world. Until the day we leave this earth, we're in a battle for our mind. Why are we in a battle for our mind? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If the enemy can get in here, he can get in here. And if he can get in here, he gets out of our, I don't know how to show you it, coming out and how we live out our lives. It just comes through. It starts here, it goes here, and it goes out here. There's a battle for our minds. And the battle never stops. The battle never stops. So I was meeting with a buddy of mine recently. So my former uh, life, not like reincarnated life, but like my, when I first began my career, I was a student pastor, five and a half years. I really thought that's what I would do for my career and, and didn't end up going that way. But I had a buddy that was just named a senior pastor after years of being a student pastor. And he said, what's the biggest difference in being a senior pastor from being a student pastor? And I said, it's exactly the same. And he's like, what? And I said, it's exactly the same. Same stuff. See, back when I was a student pastor, I'd get a call from one of the kids in the youth group. Mike, you're not going to believe this, but my boyfriend cheated on me. That's what they tell me. My boyfriend cheated on me. Well, that was bad in high school. But cheating on somebody is the same thing that happens with adults, except everything, the stakes are a little bit higher, aren't they? People that cheated on their test got sent to the principal's office. Cheat on your taxes, you get to, sent to do prison ministry from inside. All right, And so, cheat on your taxes, you go inside. Everything, same stuff. Stakes are just higher. There's a battle for our minds. The enemy knows this. Here's what we're continually bombarded with lies from. Ready? Lies from our culture, the value system around us. And we we put some scripture references you can go in and look up later. I think it'll speak to this. The value system around us is changing. How many of you see things on television now that 30 years ago your mama and daddy would have whooped your tail if that had been on the household television? But it's on every night. Raise your hand. What? It's the frog in the kettle, right? Throw the, you don't throw the frog in the kettle and turn up the heat quick. Throw the frog in the kettle and let it sit for a little while and just turn it up as it goes. There are things that are normal now that were abnormal when we were growing up, or when I grew up at least. Culture's changing. Y'all do know we live in a world where there is no right and wrong anymore. Does everybody know that? I mean, there is, whatever you want to do is right. You could put the wackiest, craziest thing on Facebook and somebody will agree with you. I agree with you 100%. You're crazy. All right, and so I mean, but, but that's the world that we live in. Culture is changing the value system of this world. All right. Listen, the value system of the world may be changing, but God's not changing. Does everybody agree with that? God's, they're still right and wrong. They're still black and white. Number two, my flesh, my old pattern of thinking. So for some of us, this walk with Christ is brand new. The Bible, especially the book of Romans, talks about our old flesh and our new flesh. We accept Christ, this new flesh begins, but that old flesh, that old way of life's still there, and it's battling for us going, do you really want this? This is more fun. You don't want that. And the third battle is the enemy. He's the father of lies. 
Everybody look at me. We got, we got to talk about this. How many of you believe that there is a God in heaven who has the best for you? If you believe that, say yes. yes. Okay. I figure you're at church. You didn't just get up. You decided to get up and come and go, there's something out there. Just as that was a yes, there is a yes to the question. There is an evil present in this world that has a uh, cruise director. And his name is Satan, Lucifer. He's the enemy. I call him the enemy. He's a villain. That's really what he is. Here's what he's the master of. Scripture calls him all throughout the New Testament. He's referred to as the father of lies. He ain't the son of lies. He's the father. He's the creator of lies. And here's what he's the master of. And I want you to write this under note because it'll help you remember. He's the master of half-truths. He tells you enough truth without telling you the whole story. See, he's the master of half troops. My mom, see, I was raised on good, just good old country wisdom. My mom's wisdom was a half truth is a whole lie, right? I got a lot of spankings for half truths. I told her what I wanted her to know, not what was truth, but I told her just enough. The enemy's the master of that. Here's why. Think of the worst mistakes you've ever bought into that you never thought about the rest of the story. You just thought about the moment. Here's the two words I want you to write down. Ready? Present, future. I want you to write these down because I hope you remember it. Present, future. The enemy is all about the present. The enemy is all about right now. This is going to be good right now. This is going to be fun right now. This is going to be what you need right now. This is going to be great right now. God always speaks to you about the future. Meaning, if you follow me and you trust me, you will have no regrets. The enemy never speaks anything about regrets. He never talks about regrets. He doesn't want you to know about regrets. He wants you to think, this is what I need right now. Adam and Eve have control of the whole garden. And the enemy comes to Eve. He says, what about the tree right there? Well, God said that I should stay away from that tree. Well, he just doesn't want you to know what he knows. And we know that Eve goes and takes a bite of the apple. And we know that from that point forward, this blame game started. They started blaming each other and this whole thing. Why? Because they bought in a half-truth. There is a father of lies, and I want everybody to look at me, that wants to destroy your life. He doesn't want you to have a bad day. He wants, if you're a follower of Christ, he wants to destroy you. If you are in this room today and you do not know Christ yet, he does not want you to know him. Therefore, he will do everything possible to keep you from knowing him. But if you are beginning a new walk with Christ, you've got a new flesh and you're beginning a new walk with Christ, he knows who you are. And he will do anything possible to neutralize you. So every Saturday morning in, in uh, high school, football coaches' offices are all watching film for next Friday's game. And here's what they're doing. They're figuring out how to scheme the next opponent. Man, that number one for them, they're really good. we got to figure out how to neutralize him coming across the line on offense. You know what they're not doing? They are not neutralizing number 74 who never left the sideline and had his arm on the water cooler staring at the cheerleaders. They're not concerned with number 74 because he's not active in the game. The enemy's the same way. If you're not active in the game, he's going to leave you alone. But if you're active in the game, he's going to figure out a way to scheme you. He's the father of what? Tell me again, the father of what? Number two, a lie believed as truth will affect me as if it were true. A lie believed as truth will affect me as if it were true. And here's the word I want you to write down, counterfeit, counterfeit. A lie believed as truth will affect me as if it is true. Social media walked in our world and is wonderful. I'm on it every day. Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. The problem is it's spoken 
non-truths into a whole generation and they're believing the lies as if they were truth. Watch this video, would you? I feel like everybody, nobody's really themselves. When you're a teenager, if people don't like you, then you're pretty much a nobody. I feel like uh, on social media, everybody's judging you. People expect you to be perfect, and when you're not, they're going to point it out. So you would <laughs> so I'd be holding my phone this way, and usually I I would take my picture like over here at this angle, and then usually I would just snap it. I usually snap like 20 selfies before I find the right one. Sometimes I text my friends and tell them to pick which one they like the best. And I think guys tend to do more the mirror selfie type thing. I'll probably go for the mirror. The mirror is probably one of the first things I go for. Twitter is always what's, what's, what's the newest tweet, what's going on in somebody's life, who's beefing. But I, I have to get ready for the selfie. You just can't take a selfie. You have to be prepared to take a selfie. I get really nervous around people because I care what people think about me a lot. If I don't get like a certain amount of likes in a certain amount of time, I wonder if I should delete it or something like that. Why isn't anybody liking this? And I'm not gonna lie, usually when I see the likes, I get pretty happy, so. <laughs> kind of brings up my self-esteem. Everybody has their own little group and you try to figure out where you fit in and uh, you're trying to fit in and get uh, almost all the groups to like you. I'm, I'm a singer, so I fit in with mostly like the chorus kids. Um, the quiet, kind of the quiet, quiet people. I guess it makes me feel good about myself. Um, like, I'm pretty, I guess. Social media plays a big part in everything, really. If you have that many followers, then you're, well, not popular, but you're accepted and everybody likes you. Whenever I smile, one of my eyebrows raises and it really bothers me. Most people that people like are really outgoing, so I don't really, like people to know that I'm shy. I just start to point out the things that I don't like about myself. I begin picking all the flaws that I see. My nose, it's like a little pointy, you see? I'm always thinking about the way I look. I have pretty squinty eyes, so. I really wish I was a little bit more muscular. Maybe I have a girlfriend or something, but I don't, so. Here's, here's the crazy part about it. That is a whole generation. We've got a lot of principals out in the room today. It's a whole generation of kids are believing things that are lies that they think are truth. But here's what I know. I know as we get older, we do the same stinking things. I want you to write down a couple thoughts. Common lies we're tempted to believe. I'm not good enough. God can't or doesn't like me. I'll never measure up. That's a lie we believe. I'm not good enough. This is just the way that I am. God can't change me, which is hopeless. It's just the way that I am. Mike, I, I, can't, I can't change. It's hopeless. I'm too far gone. I am what I do or what I've done. God won't accept me. I am what I do or what I've done. God won't accept me or I'm not smart enough or strong enough, God can't use me. I want you to write a little word down. Maybe it'll, a word picture will help you remember it. Write the word adoption down. I love adoption stories. Just here in a couple weeks, I'll get to dedicate a young man that was just adopted by a precious little couple here at North Star. They were... They, they found the birth mother, and the, the birth mother wasn't going to keep the child, and they have adopted this child, and we'll get to dedicate that child. Grandparents will get to be here. Family gets to be here, and man, they wanted that. What I love about adoption is they wanted that child. How many of y'all watched the show, This Is Us? Oh, dear Lord. All right, don't even get me started. I'll be crying the rest of the day. Anyways, there's it's, it's a great adoption story in that. It's, it's great. I love adoption because there's a choice involved. 
Man, I love my kids to death, but when they arrived at the hospital, I was stuck with them. You know what I'm talking about? And so I, it wasn't like God said, do you want them? Nah, I'll leave them here, all right? And so I, I, I didn't really get a choice. We took them home. I love them. They're great kids. Casey and Mary Michael, I apologize. But anyway, so, but adoption, it's a parent choosing the child, right? Choosing them. You imagine being in an orphanage and having no family if we were all in another part of this world where there was no family. We lost our families to, to AIDS or violence or the refugees and, and we were all in a room and, and this is all that we knew and we just knew each other but we didn't have a family unit and we heard that there was a potential family coming to adopt. Here's what I guarantee all of us would do. We would clean up and we'd put on our jackets and our little ties and our cute little dresses and, and we would have our best behavior because we would want that family to take us. And we'd want to show them our best. We wouldn't show them our anger. We wouldn't show them our bad side. We'd show them our best side. Can you imagine that family coming and looking across the room and, and choosing the little boy or little girl next to you and not choosing you? And, and you, they leave and you're all disappointed and upset. And you get, out of your, you get out of your costume that you got on. You put on your regular clothes. And you're not quite as nice as you were when they were there you're a little more upset and a little angry you got sort of the natural thing going on that we all have and then you find out that all along there's been a camera over in the corner of the room that there's an adoptive parent that's been watching not when they came to visit they watched you all the time and they would say we've got someone coming to visit this weekend for an adoption but they know everything about you. You would go, there's no way they would ever want me. They know all my bad stuff. But that adoptive family, that adoptive parent walks in and he walks into a room this size and he says, I don't want one of you. I want all of you. I know everything about you and I want you anyways. See, there's a whole word that's used in our culture. We're all God's children. We're not all God's children. We're all God's creation. We're not all God's children. We're God's children. We're adopted into his kingdom. He chose you. I know what the world tells you. Everybody listen to me. He chose you because he wants you. He chose you because he saw something in you. In his eyes, you are good enough. In his eyes, you are a new creation. You're not your old self. You are not hopeless. Finally, number three, I must constantly be reminded of what is true about me. And it's got to be every day. You are bombarded with lies every day. Bombard yourself with truth every day. He said whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is of good repute, or good reputation, think about these things. Whatever is lovely, think about these things. Because I'm bombarded daily, I must battle daily. I must battle daily. We talk all the time at North Star. I am so glad you are here this morning. It makes my day. Do y'all know this is crazy? October is our worst attended month of the year. Is that not crazy? I think people get lost in corn mazes. I don't know what happens, but, but it's like nobody's here. But it's every church. I will get a call at 1 o'clock today from Westridge, Freedom, Cedar Crest, all my buddies around here, and they'll go, are my people at your church today? Because it, it's, it's universal. October's worst month of the year. I'm glad you're here. I really am. I'm, gl I'm glad you came. But if you depend on one day's truth to carry you for the week, it ain't enough. You got to get in God's word every day. We have Digging Deeper. It's a devotion written off the sermon. It'll come to your inbox every day or it's on your app. You can go to northstarchurch.org slash digging deeper. You can go to the app store, click digging deeper, and it'll go right to you every day. You've got you version on your phone. There are apps. There are devotional plans that you can use every day. You've got to remind yourself daily. Number one, you got to examine yourself in prayer and allow the spirit to remind you. You gotta examine yourself in prayer and allow the Spirit to remind you. Thank God for all He's done. Say, God, I need you to speak to me. You probably, before you get out of bed in the morning, you get up, click your phone, and check it. 
I remember Kit, who was in Compass this morning. Kit was speaking to a group of high school students, and I was sitting in the room. He said, how many of you, the minute your eyes wake up, you open up your phone, and you click an app? And check and see what everybody's been doing last night. And every kid, 30 kids in the room, every one of the kids in the room checked Instagram before they even got out of their bed. If we're going to have been, be bombarded by what the world says, we've got to bombard ourselves with what God says. Number two, immerse yourself in Scripture and let God remind you. Fix your thoughts on what is true. You will be told plenty of lies. Fix your eyes on what is truth. How do they teach bankers and people in commerce to find a counterfeit bill? Get to know the real one so well you can see the counterfeit. Man, you immerse yourself in Scripture, all of a sudden, the lies won't be as easy to follow because you know what's true. And finally, surround yourself with believers who will remind you. Keep putting into practice. Man, we have groups here, and I'm just, I can't tell you. It's just good to know you're not alone. It's good to know you're not alone. It's good to know. Everybody look at me. You're not a bad person because you're in the battle. You are human. That's why you're in the battle. Don't do it alone. If you stay isolated, he's got you. And he'll get you. We got a church family here to surround you during your tough seasons. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a battle for you. There's a battle for this, and there's a battle for this. If you're a mom and dad sitting in this room, you may have a child at Closer this weekend. You know what he'll do to extinguish your child's fire that they walk home with? He'll get your faith to be the water for their fire. Because your faith's weak, and it pours water on their fire. What are you so fired up about, man? It, don't, don't worry about that. Or you could be the gasoline on the fire. God could use your faith to grow their faith. He has an identity for you. He has a new, remember, Paul talked about it very first week of the series, in Christ, in Christ. That is our new identity, and that is what he has for you. Would you pray with me? God, I pray we never get over you. Father, I pray that we don't believe what the world says. We say, God, I want to know what you think. I want to know how you feel about me. I want to know the plans you have for me, the plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. God, you told us about the father of lies. You told us Jesus said it. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come you might have life and have it to the full. God, I don't want our people sitting in our rooms this morning to live a short, changed life, a life of regrets. God, I don't want them to know what you think about them. I want them to live in peace, knowing they're walking with you day by day. They will walk through battles. They will face tough things, but knowing that we're not alone walks us through. Father, God, just breathe and speak over our lives today. The one who knows everything about us and wants us anyways, speak over us today. And may your voice be the voice we remember.